very good afternoon, and thank you for joining us at this press conference with the Commission of Inquiry on the Occupied Palestinian Territory and in Israel. The three commissioners are with me, Ms. Navi Pillay, the chairperson of the three-person commission. On my left is Chris Sadoti, a member of the commission, and Milun Kotari on the far uh, of the table. The commissioners presented their first report to the Human Rights Council uh, yesterday, and this was followed by an interactive discussion, which concluded this morning. As you know, we've shared with you the uh, list, uh, rather the statement that was delivered yesterday, and uh, the report itself was made public last week. So the commissioners wanted to take this opportunity to meet with you, and so we'll turn it over immediately to Ms. Pillay for her opening remarks, and then to you for your questions. Thank you. Go ahead, please. Well, thank you very much for being here. Media is very, very important for the work of the Commission uh, because we're very interested in receiving submissions from all over the world. We do believe that uh, the conflict in, uh, in the Middle East here uh, involving Israel and Palestine has global consequences. So once again, thank you for being here. My colleagues are Milun Katari from India and Chris Sidoti uh, from Australia, and they will take most of the questions. Um, so as, as uh, the moderator has said, we've already delivered our report. We sent it well ahead to, in particular, to Israel and Palestine. And it's clear from that report that we were not engaging on issues that the certain NGOs seem to have planned on. What we did is, since the mandate is so expansive, we picked on the paragraph uh, which requires us to analyze the similarities in the findings and recommendations of all United Nations fact-finding missions and commissions of inquiry, and this is what we did. It's massive. It's all the recommendations from 2018, and we included the treaty bodies. And in further reports, we're going to also be looking at Security Council recommendations, General Assembly, uh, and other UN bodies. This is not done before, where we take the collective, the sum total of recommendations that were made, and then see whether any of them were implemented. So that's a sorry tale that despite these high-profile recommendations made by experts and by member states, none of those recommendations were carried out by Israel. So that's the content of the first report, if you had uh, an opportunity to see that. And um, we, of course, are, uh, have an unlimited mandate. We will be reporting to the General Assembly in October and the focus of our recommendation as we looked at as, and assessed all the recommendations made so far is that the root cause is clearly the occupation and the occupation must end. There are very many um, consequences of this occupation. We will be addressing them in detail in subsequent reports. So unlike other commissions, who just have the opportunity to file a single report and then their term is over, we are going to be continuing investigating this. Uh, while we are here in Geneva, we're going to be holding a round table of experts. Many, many of them are academics, uh, Jewish academics coming from Israel to see us or they will be online. Why do I mention that? To say how we, we are listening to all stakeholders. Um, of whatever political point of view, or so on. Um, so we call this a perpetual occupation, and we say that's the core underlying root cause of ongoing violence, you know, displayed in terms of the forced displacement, the threats of forced dis displacement, demolitions, settlement construction and expansions, settler violence, and the blockade of Gaza. And as we all know, this has endured for decades, and there's a sense of despair and hopelessness within the Palestinian population, um, as well as in Israel and the diaspora. We're disappointed that Israel has uh, not permitted us to, to visit Israel. 
to see for ourselves, to talk to victims, particularly of the Hamas rocket attacks. It's very important that we have a balanced report reflecting the situation of all victims. Um, you know, I constantly hear murmuring that we're very biased and we only represent the one side, that's uh, anti-Israel side. So I'm, uh, I don't, I cannot understand why they wouldn't let us in and interview appropriate witnesses. However, as a, as a compensation, as I said earlier, um, we're very much in touch with uh, Israeli Jews, and many of them came out to Jordan when we physically interv uh, held interviews. So that was a, um, a huge surprise to me like, that we had like almost 20 representatives of organizations who took the trouble to cross the borders and come to us. And I think we commissioners feel, and I definitely notice the difference, that there is increased interest from the public on, on, on solving the situation in Israel and Palestine. Um, during the um, dialogue, uh, we, the, the overwhelming majority of states uh, address, uh, supported the mandate, supported our work, and we feel very encouraged by that. However, there were some states, such as the United States, that delivered a statement um, together with the support of four member states. I know they said they had 22 states, but it's four member states of the Human Rights Council. We expressed disappointment uh, with that view and, and, ex and asked how, how do they explain the double standards of rushing to uh, oppose what's happening in Ukraine, the invasion, annexation, setting up a, a commission of inquiry there and their reluctance to support uh, the situation of uh, human rights protections in Palestine. We, and we call that double standards as well. And I hope that that message gets through. So I will just stop there and see if my colleagues have any initial remarks. But we're very much interested in your questions. Thank you. Thank you, Rona. Chris, hello. Any opening remarks? No? Okay, we'll take questions on you. Thank you very much, Ms. Pillay. Over to you now for questions. So, turning to Zoom, we have a question from Laurent Sierra of Swiss News Agency. If we can unmute Laurent, please. Go ahead. Yeah, thank you. Uh, thank you, Rolando. Thank you, commissioners, for the, the press conference. Um, first, so now you're going to lead your own investigation uh, after having assessed all these previous recommendations. So what would be the, the topic uh, and the components that you will start with in the, the investigation that you would like to, to lead? And then yesterday you complained about the fact that the funding that was planned for your mandate has been, um, has been reduced or not all the funding was given. Uh, who do you attribute that to? Thank you. Well, thank you for those questions, and you're quite right. This is really a report of what other experts had said, and, and, and we assess the implementation part. So we have an expansive mandate, and number one is we will be doing our own investigations. That's why we're very keen to conduct interviews with all stakeholders to see what the situation is like on the ground. And we have set certain priorities. Firstly, we have to deliver a report to the UNGA in uh, October. We'll be working on that, and for that, we are consulting a whole lot of experts on the occupation, how it could be ended. Uh, you know, we're not uh, state parties. They are the ones who have to work out solutions, but we I should be in a position to make recommendations. Um, my colleagues will add to this. You know, you, you could see the various uh, issues raised by people, the effect on children, um, just the, the effect of the rocket attacks on, is, on Israelis, so various issues like that. This 
Traditionally, commissions of inquiry focus on an episode that just happened, such as now the killing of the journalist, Shireen Ali Akhel, and notice that we have not followed that pattern because very fortunately we have this very wide mandate to address the root causes. Um, and also to conduct our own investigations and to address justice and accountability, which is usually not the portfolio of human rights. Um, so we're very interested in, in the part of the mandate that requires us to identify individuals who are responsible and to work with judicial institutions for possible prosecutions and to secure justice. So all this is new. We will gradually work out for each report uh, what we are going to focus on. With the funding that's reduced, yes, you know, I originally thought the assessment made by OHCHR was small to begin with, which was 24 uh, T uh, staff members. We got 18. And I don't know who does what in the UN Third Committee, but it seems some states have the power to reduce funding. Once again, um, it seems there is lack of interest in supporting human rights issues when it involves Israel, and yet the same uh, members of the uh, Third Committee granted huge amounts to the I mechanisms for, for Syria and for Myanmar. We've, we've raised these issues with member states because oh, it is they who can address this issue. So on these two questions, let me and to you. What did I say? Third committee. Fifth committee. Yeah. So it's fifth committee. Sorry about that. Um, yeah, good afternoon, everyone. Um, on, the, on the question of what are the issues we are going to address, you will have seen in our first report that we've identified a number of issues. Um, the uh, in the, we were very sort of pleased with the response for the last two days of the overwhelming number of states who, in their own statements, reinforced uh, the issues that we had raised in our, in our report. And I want to just say that the report is not only based on uh, what has preceded us, uh, the COIs and the reports of the special rapporteurs and treaty bodies, but also testimonies that we have ourselves taken when we did a field visit to Amman. And also, we've done an, a series of online, secure online interviews with, uh, with civil society leaders, with academics, um, and, and others. So the main issues that are coming out, which were reinforced over the last few days by uh, a number of states, are um, the persistent discrimination against Palestinians, the construction of illegal settlements, uh, forced evictions and demolitions, uh, that continue to drive the violence and the conflict. And, and uh, this is very important, this particular issue we will be taking up because as you all have been following, there are ongoing evictions uh, right now in, uh, in the West Bank, in Area C, in an area that Israel has um, designated as a firing zone in the area of Masafer Yata. And uh, there have been, what we would like to stress in our reports is that this is an incremental deliberate policy of the State of Israel to have uh, you know, evictions periodically, but it all adds up to uh, a, a situation of perpetual occupation, which is what we have raised. And uh, you have seen in the reports of other mandate holders, if I can just give you some statistics, just beginning this year, from the beginning of this year, there are 64 uh, Palestinian-owned structures that have been demolished, uh, 130 Palestinians have been displaced. There's, there's been a range of um, you know, uh, property property acquisitions and so on. And I mean, all this data is available, so I won't go into it. But um, so, so these are the kinds of issues that we will be raising. But uh, just to reinforce what the chair was saying, we, we are not looking only at individual events of human rights violations, but we are trying to establish patterns, patterns that are historical, patterns that are, you know, in a way inimical to the, to the occupation that are uh, that are leading to this constant uh, cycles of, of violence and, and conflict. And we, in our, in our forthcoming reports, um, hope to pick up, uh, pick up on these themes. I just wanted to also say that, um, just on the point, again, that the chair raised, which we reinforced in our closing remarks this morning at the council, uh, this, we are very concerned about this issue of double standards. Um, 
and and now it has sharply come out uh, in the context of um, of of the crisis in in Ukraine, uh, and we are very clear that these are these are double standards, and and, and the international community is rightly appalled in the face of aggression and occupation and has correctly moved to act swiftly and collectively uh, and forcefully to ensure compliance with international law. But in the case of Israel and Palestine, there has been inaction for decades and it continues. And recent data has actually shown that the very countries who are supporting uh, the, the, the work on um, the, the scrutiny of what's happening in Ukraine, um, you know, led uh, because of actions from Russia, have consistently supported um, commissions of inquiry over the last uh, 20 years. Uh, all the inquiries that the council has uh, initiated, except for the ones on Israel and Palestine. So we want to continue to stress this with the European Union, with the United States. Primarily, it's the Western countries that, are, um, that have shown this uh, duplicity and this complicity, uh, if I can say. And, um, and also, I just wanted to add that one of, the, one of the encouraging aspects for us has been the, um, the, we are greatly emboldened in our work by the tremendous support that we have received also from Jewish groups, uh, civil society groups, academics, even parts of the media, former diplomats from, from within Israel, some of whom we will be meeting next week when we have our roundtable um, to inform the content of our General Assembly report. Thank you. Thank you both. We have a question now from Jean Zaracostas. John. Go yes, ahead. good afternoon. Nice to see familiar faces on the podium. Um, my question is uh, with what uh, Madame Pillay just mentioned, that you'll be looking uh, with a wide mandate for justice and accountability. Will it be like the Commission of Inquiry on Syria where the evidence they collect, they forward to various national or international uh, or multilateral judicial structures to follow through? Uh, what is exactly the terms of reference? And in your inquiry, will you also be uh, interviewing uh, officials in the UN system who are on the ground uh, for many decades, uh, I'm interested in particular on access to health and attacks on health. Thank you. John, I think you've been around even longer than this conflict has. Um, the, the two questions. Um, accountability is a, a, an important component of our mandate. And in fact, the way in which accountability is framed in the mandate, it's different from other commissions of inquiry. Um, this is one of the reasons why the resources issue has arisen for us. Um, we, we have to act a little bit like the investigative mechanisms on Syria and Myanmar in collecting information, storing it, um, ensuring its uh, organisation and availability for accountability mechanisms, that is national and international courts operating in accordance with international standards of justice. So we have this expanded mandate and, and we will be uh, taking that accountability side seriously. Um, we are already in touch, for example, with the Office of the Prosecutor of the International Criminal Court and uh, later this week we'll be having a further meeting with the Office. Um, we hope to be similarly involved with other courts that are interested in accountability so far as Israel and Palestine are concerned. Uh, that is an explicit part of our mandate. And so the simple answer, yes, um, that is part of what we will be doing. And uh, we have already commenced that task and will be continuing it. And the answer to the second question also is yes. Um, we have met already with UN officials on the ground uh, in the region and will continue to do so. We have to form our own independent conclusions, um, as the Chair has indicated. Uh, but certainly UN officials who are there, um, who are providing services, who are monitoring what is occurring, are for us critical parts um, of the evidentiary base. Um, they can tell us a great deal, um, not as victims obviously, but as, as witnesses in many respects of direct issues, um, but also as people who have a, a good analysis of the situation. So we have already been in touch with them extensively 
and we will continue to do so. Thank you very much. Do we have further questions? We have uh, Nick Cumming Bruce of the New York Times. If we can unmute Nick, please. Go ahead, Nick. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, I was interested by Ms. Pillay's comment that um, she seemed to feel as a result of the discussions you've had in Jordan particularly, that there was more interest now in finding solutions in Israel. I'm, I'm more interest in relate compared with what? Um, how do you measure or assess this trajectory? And um, you're going to be dogged with allegations of bias as you go forward. One of the allegations is that um, you're only talking to organizations from Israel that are interested in condemning Israel. Um, I, I don't want to give that any particular substance, but I just wonder if you could push back a little bit at the the, the accusations that this is an institutionally uh, biased uh, mechanism and um, that it's it's serving a, a specifically biased agenda. Thank you. Well, thank you for your question, Nick. Um, I think many believe the longer they hear this allegation of bias, that there must be some truth in it. We are welcoming submissions from anyone, everyone, ready to talk to anyone. You, In, in the council today, there was a NGO uh, uh, input that they sent us five million um, submissions. So all of them would be pro-Israel, shall I characterize them as such. Uh, we've actually received 2.5 million. And we have many constraints, of course, with the lack of staff and so on, but all of that will be saved. We will look into all that, and if need be, we will meet. With the, with the persons who made that submission. In this case, it's one website that has sent 2.5 million submissions, and it appears to be a record of all the Jews who were killed in the Holocaust. So it's a long list of names, but I've not seen them personally, so I say this with some caution and assure you that we will be looking at all of this, very much interested in the views of uh, Israelis, of Jews, Palestinians, Bedouins, or anyone who wishes to enlighten us on any matter. Um, you know, I have a previous record where I was the first high commissioner to go on an official mission to Israel, invited by them. So I made sure. I went to Serodet, if I'm pronouncing it correctly, and, and, and talked, talked with, and saw how afraid those children were because of these crashing rockets coming from the other side. Um, it's that kind of impartiality and independence that this commission uh, will bring to its work. You know, all three of us would not have agreed to participate if we had been told by anyone that you can't do this or you can't do that. So we don't come with any preconceived notions here. Um, but uh, but you, if you look at the report we already filed, the assessment we made of all the recommendations made so far since 2018, um, those are factual uh, findings and, and assessments by experts. So really, if they are all presumed to be biased, Security Council that issued resolutions, Human Rights Council, all these member states, they are all biased, then I would say I'm in distinguished company. But seriously, we want everyone to take this commission seriously because it's the first time it, has, it can look into political questions, which you can't do under the Human Rights Council uh, regular mandates. And we all are very keen to find solutions. We're not here just to say how bad things are. People on the ground know it's bad. We want contribution on ideas, on solutions, and how we can persuade change. Yeah, and uh, if I can just add on this point of bias, um, you know, we, we are, our work is based on international standards. It's humanitarian law, human rights law, criminal law. It's based on truth uh, that, you know, there's overwhelming evidence, the testimonies that we are taking. And one way to remove this issue of bias would be for Israel to allow us entry uh, into, inside the Green Line, to allow us entry into the West Bank uh, for us to also make it uh, easier for us to go um, 
to go into Gaza. We, we want to interview and uh, the, the victims of the Hamas rockets. We want to interview victims of, uh, that are there because of Palestinian violence, um, but we have to be allowed to do that. Uh, we cannot be kept away from these territories and areas, and then there would be a, a, you know, an accusation of bias. And, and here I want to say that the, uh, the disappearance or the non-appearance of Israel uh, at the Human Rights Council uh, for us is very disturbing because it also shows a disrespect for the, for the council itself. Uh, there are General Assembly resolutions that call on all members of the council to, to uh, to be present, uh, to respond even if they don't agree to a mandate. It's the same problem with the United States. Uh, they're issuing a joint statement against a mechanism that has been adopted by the Human Rights Council, shows, shows great disrespect uh, for, the human, for the functioning of the Human Rights Council. And they're a new member, uh, and, and this, is not, this does not bode well for the credibility of the United States. And they're going ahead further and getting as many signatures as possible to their statement. Uh, which was in any case considerably watered down, um, we, we do not accept that. We, we hope that all UN, all members of the Human Rights Council respect the sanctity of the body and of the United Nations. Thanks. We have further questions? Colleagues? No, I don't see any other little yellow hands popping up. Oh, there's another follow-up from Nick. Go ahead, Nick, please. Uh, well, yes, I'd just like to come back to this point that, um, uh, that Ms. Pale made about is finding Israelis who are more interested now in solutions. Uh, and I, I didn't get a sense of, of how she feels Israelis are more interested now as opposed to before. Um, uh, and I wonder if she could address that point. And particularly, I mean, in, in reference to a report which has very much pinpointed uh, the continuing occupation as the root cause of the violence. Is she saying that there is now a growing evidence of opinion that says this occupation has to be brought to an end? Thank you. You know, I realize, Nick, that I hadn't responded to that. It's not only because of my own experience as a former High Commissioner that I say, I see now, I note an increased interest in participation, particularly by Israeli Jews. Firstly, in the number of submissions we received, the uh, good response we've received now when we asked for experts to participate in the round table. Uh, I think there are very many academics in Israel who are publishing articles and books, and maybe they're not able to ventilate their points of views within the country, and they want to use the commission to do so. I, I don't know yet who they are and what they're going to say. So I have no idea whether they're pro-Israel or anti-Israel. I'm talking about the interest and, um, and, and uh, how much I welcome that they want to engage with the uh, commission. From the submissions made, we can see very active litigation, even by um, organizations that are not Palestinian organizations. They, they, are, they are even now litigating, litigating in Israel over the banning of these uh, six NGOs who have been declared terrorist organization and prohibited from functioning. So I see this interesting trend. There isn't the divide between um, uh, people who are unhappy with the situation in Israel inside Israel, as there is outside in the diaspora, they seem to think there's a very huge divide here that these two groups are antagonistic to one another. They're not. Um, we spent, I think, four days in Jordan listening to well-known uh, NGOs, others, women's rights activists. So they were talking about the consequences to all people in Israel, mainly Palestine, but all people. And that's why I say, I was so surprised that 20 representatives of organizations came um, at great risk to themselves. Some obviously could not come. They were not allowed to travel. Some reported that they'd been followed and so on. One person was actually detained at the border on the Israeli side and couldn't 
come to our meetings that told me the risks they face and yet they want to be able to tell their stories. They want a voice in these reports that we are filing. Um, I don't know if my colleagues yeah. have anything here. Yeah. I can add on that, Nick. Uh, you know, there's a sort of a tremendous outpouring now of uh, material, uh, as Navi is saying, uh, from, his, from leading academics, Israeli Jewish academics, historians. Uh, we even see a change in the, in the media. Uh, you, you have probably followed all the articles in the Haaretz. Uh, many things that we read that we would never read in the United States press uh, of the analysis of uh, what is going wrong. You have so many more uh, religious Jewish groups that are outspoken. They're, they're saying what, whatever Israel as a state is doing is is, is a terrible distortion of, of, of Zionism, of the, you know, of the holy books of Judaism. Um, so so there, is, there is a, I mean, there is a kind of a groundswell developing. We are not saying it's there yet, but I think it's the responsibility of the media all over the world to, to investigate this and see. Uh, I mean, the, the, the crisis, of course, in Israel is that that, that part of the society which is, which is critical of Israeli occupation policies uh, does not have much of a voice in the Knesset, in the parliament. But these are issues that we are following, and when we speak to them directly, which will be next week and in the coming months, uh, we want to get to the bottom of that. And as Navi was saying, we, we would also like to participate, uh, even though our work is very victim-centered, we would also like to participate in, in whatever solutions or avenues for peace that may be developing. But there's definitely a change, I would say, uh, we would say in the last, uh, few years. Thank you. I'd add just one point uh, about the context in which what Navi and Maloon describes is occurring. And, and that is that we are just embarking on a period of possibility so far as this protracted conflict is concerned. Um, it, it, it's been in a position, a, a, a static position now, for 20 years. Um, a generation has passed without really any significant progress at all in resolving this dispute. But now we see instability increasing, continuing within the Israeli political leadership. We see the inevitable, inevitability of human life about to affect a change in the leadership of Fatah and the Palestinian Authority, and the same dynamic inevitably occurring amongst many of the most senior leaders of Hamas. There is a, a possibility in the next couple of years, for the first time in a generation, um, of new people and new ideas and new openings. Um, I'm not naive, I'm not utopian. I don't say that this window is wide open, but I say that it's open a little bit. And that places a grave responsibility on the international system and individual states to take advantage of what may be a once in a generation opportunity to pressure for change, push for change. Um, reopen possibilities that have been locked. Now, that may not come again for another generation if it doesn't succeed in the next few years. And for me individually, the, the importance of this commission of inquiry is the opportunity to make a small contribution to opening that window of possibility a bit further. Thank you all very much. We have a, another question from John Zaracostas. Ahead, yes, it's a, a bit uh, logistical. I didn't uh, catch the details. You'll be meeting with the Office of the Prosecutor of the ICC in The Hague or in Geneva and the round table meetings will take place in Geneva or in the region. Thank you. Well, uh, hi, John. The, the round table will be in Geneva next week, uh, Monday, Tuesday, and uh, our meetings with the Office of the Prosecutor will be in The Hague. But we also hope to have roundtables elsewhere as time yep. goes. This will be a methodology for us during the life of the COI. Okay, thank you once again.
Any further questions before we close? I think in that case, we will close this press conference and take this opportunity to thank you all very much for joining us and to you, of course, online for joining us for this important press conference. Have a good afternoon.